Uh, all the time, God is good. Well done. Yeah, see, we can, we can do this. I just got to practice this one more time. Say amen. amen. Uh, how about a hallelujah? hallelujah? Oh, man, this sounds really good when you're up here. I got to tell you, it is good to give praise to the Lord. Let's uh, dismiss for commotion. They're already commoting. They're, they're out of here. <laughs> Let's uh, take a minute to, uh, to pray together. We're going to dig into, once again, we're going to be in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 18 through 25, and uh, we'll be looking at that in just a moment. Let's ask God to open our hearts and our minds to His Word that we might learn to walk as He has called us to walk. Father, we lift up your name. Bless the name of the Lord. May the reputation and the glory and the honor of you in this place, in our homes, in our families, in our lives be lifted up. Jesus, this is for your glory. We come here today to worship together, to be together, to experience our King, to celebrate in song, to fellowship with one another. Yes, to bring our offerings, to, to hear your word and to learn and to be transformed by it. And we thank you for the privilege of all of it. Father, as we get ready to read, I know our hearts can run in a, a hundred thousand different directions. And so we ask you to call us home, <laughs> to help us in this time to focus, to hear your word and to heed it for your glory. For that is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our King. Amen. Amen. Well, this week, um, I don't know how many of you get breakpoint commentary by email or hear it on the radio. Uh, if you don't, let me just have you write that down in the corner of your bulletin or, or in the edge of your heart or something like that. And look it up. John Stone Street has uh, good regular commentary just on cultural events from a biblical, biblical perspective and helping us as Christians to kind of frame a Christian worldview. And uh, one of the issues that he was dealing with this week is how Christianity has brought all of the good things that people who aren't even Christians desire into the world. And even atheistic writers are known for commenting, or philosophers are known for commenting on the fact that wherever Christianity has gone, uh, the plight of women has, in, has improved, the uh, education has improved, healthcare has improved, well-being in general has improved because Christianity Christianity works because it is true. The truth that is in the gospel, the truth that is in God's word, it elevates people everywhere they go. Now, it doesn't always start easy, does it? It's just like when you and I first became Christians, our life didn't always. There are, now, I do know some folks that, I mean, they accepted Christ on Thursday, and as of Friday morning, their life was a 180 in the other direction. I mean, just everything. But for the most of us, we'll, we'll come to Christ, and then there's slow gradual growth, right? <laughs> slow gradual is, is kind of the, the mantra of our life, and slow gradual growth is okay. Uh, God likes to work in that. But we're going to address one of those issues today that, uh, that you know, Christianity often gets a bad rap, uh, and the Bible often gets a bad, bad rap for uh, the perceived take on slavery in the Scripture. So let's take a look. We're in, we're in 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, and, and we're having some issues. I had some issues exporting it to PowerPoint and everything else this week. So um, this, is, this is let your fingers do the walking in your actual real paper Bible. It's not going to be on the screen. So if you don't have a paper Bible, use the digital one that you can find. And I can't even find my cell phone, so nobody knows where that's at. But um, it'll show up or it won't. I don't, you know, whatever. But we're here, I want you to take a look at what is going on in, I, I really want to start in verse 13 because that's the framework text. See, I told you verse 18 and I'm, I'm backing up because you can never get too much scripture, it's not going to hurt you. So let's take a look at just his opening phrase there as Peter begins teaching us, this is the outflow, this is what happens when Christianity moves into your life. Be subject, he says, for the Lord's sake to every human institution. Then he's going to go on a list, you know, whether it's the emperor or the governor, you know, whatever. whatever. But, but this is, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. Now we can go down to verse 18 because this is where not only does the rubber hits the road, but it, it can get there really uncomfortably if we're paying attention to the text. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every institution, human institution, verse 13. Verse 18, servants, servants. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, 
not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. What credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? (laughs) But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you've been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued, entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but now have now returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. Opening word, the opening salvo there, servants. Now, we have this English translation thing that happens in our head, and we read servants, and we think the butler or her, something like that, you know. Uh, Downton Abbey, you know, if you're one of those, watch that, don't, don't ask because I won't tell. Um, you know, one of those sh- shows that involves, you know, household servants or something like that, well, kind of, kind of, but we can't sugarcoat the reality that we're talking to slaves, people who don't have the freedom to pick a never, another employer if things aren't going their way. Uh, how many of you, I know some of you like own a business, but how many of you have ever worked for somebody else? Yeah, we've all worked at some point in time for somebody else. And you know what? Here's the reality. I, I felt like at times that I've been in jobs that, oh man, I just don't love it here. And you know what? There was a freedom. <laughs> if I wasn't able to enjoy the job, I could open up the one ads and go to another spot and, and, and go work at a different grocery store or whatever the case might be. Uh, these guys didn't have that chance. These are people who are enslaved. And slavery came in lots of different flavors in the Roman Empire. Um, there was... Well, uh, there was what we would call chattel slavery, where, where, where people were captured and brought to a foreign land, and uh, they were forced to work for the rest of their life or die. And, and that existed. You also had contractual slavery. Uh, let's say I'd racked up the visa card and couldn't pay it back, and you agreed to pay off my visa card if I would just come to work for you. And so I would, I would then be enslaved to you because you paid off my visa card. And so now it was a, it was a contractual obligation. And sometimes, I mean, it, it kind of went in different ways. In, in the Jewish Old Testament view of slavery, um, that could last for seven years. And once I'd worked those seven years, I was supposed to be freed. <laughs> Uh, you know, so it was a real kind of a more modern equivalent of what we would think about employment. But in most of the Roman Empire, if I paid off your visa card, you were mine for the rest of your life. And by the way, if you had any kids, they were mine too. You know, so that's, that's the kind of slavery they were in. And this was so enculturated, you know, we kind of ask the question, you know, why, why, why doesn't the Bible deal with slavery by just like in chapter and verse saying slavery is evil, you know, people are equal in the image of God and so to enslave them is wrong and you guys are just sinners for doing it, so stop. Why, why doesn't the Bible do that? That's the big question that gets thrown out and people get angry about. And, and one of the things that they don't realize is the way the Bible handles the issue of slavery isn't to say, it's okie doke, don't worry about it, but rather to undermine it by teaching good theology so that it collapses under its own weight. And that's how the Bible deals, by the way, with lots of other sins as well, undermining it so that it ultimately collapses under its own weight. You know, the Bible doesn't address life the way we wish it were. We could all recognize there are moments in our life where we could kind of uh, sit down with a scratch pad and dream of the things that we wish were part, right, of our lives. Just the, the dream sheet. I don't know what you want to call it. You know, if, if, if I could do anything, you know, you get those, those questions every once in a while. If you won a million dollars, what would you do today? Well, I'd want to know who gave me the lottery ticket for one because I don't go by them. But I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's one of the questions. The, the Bible speaks of slavery because at the time it's written, slavery exists. And by the way, I, gotta, I hate to tell you that it still exists today. It's calculated by certain groups that there are more slaves in the sex industry today than there ever were in the South picking cotton. That should disturb you because it's still going on in America. Most of those pictures that show up on the internet are pictures involving slavery. And you know what I'm talking about. 
So even before we continue on, we have to deal with this question of slavery because the Bible is dealing with it. So let's just, let's just play a little thought game for just a moment. What would have happened if Peter and Paul and Jesus had just come out and said, you know, this whole slavery thing that is so institutionalized that there are actually more slaves in Rome than there are free people, this, this thing that exists as a part of the primary fabric of the entire culture is sinful and uh, we need to tear it down or, you know, it's just not going to work. What would have happened? Well, it's not like certain other sins. You know, you teach somebody that theft is wrong, and, you know, the rest of society isn't yelling, we love theft, keep it up, right? Well, we're facing some other, you know, issues on the sexual front today where people are saying, but we love this sin, so keep it up. But slavery was one of those issues. If they had gone out and started preaching that, a couple of things would have happened. Number one, Peter and Paul would have been immediately put to death for destabilizing the empire. That wouldn't, we know, because there are historical records of people who caused insurrections, and those insurrectionists were usually crucified immediately, okay? So second of all, many, many innocent slaves would have been killed simply to make a statement. Well, how do you know that? Well, once again, we can go back to the history, and we can see, how did Rome treat its slave population? And not just Rome, how did Greece treat its slave population? Well, that's how. <laughs> In order to make a statement, they would just kill a bunch of them. Number three, Christianity would have been immediately outlawed before it even had a chance to take root. It wouldn't have been able to spread anywhere. And so sometimes you have to pick your battles. And this was an issue of picking a battle. But the way that Peter picks it is tremendous. The way that Paul elsewhere is going to pick the battle against slavery is truly amazing. Here's another issue. Christian slave families would have been torn apart and sold to masters around the empire just to break up the descent. Your children would have been sold over there probably to the salt mines. Your, uh, your wife would have been sold over there, probably uh, harvesting some kind of toxic chemical. Um, and, and you guys would have been put to the outskirts of society. Christian slaves to good and gentle masters would probably have been sold off, potentially to much worse environments, <laughs> separated from their families altogether. In other words, it just, just disaster would have happened. But what did they do? Well, what they did is they began teaching the full equality of both slave and slave owner. In fact, if you've ever read the book of Philemon in the New Testament, if you haven't read the book of Philemon, it's really, really short. You can read it in 20 minutes. It's the shortest, I think, the shortest. Jude might beat it. It's one of the shortest letters in the New Testament. And in that letter, Paul just floats this idea that this, the runaway slave Onesimus that, that Philemon owned, and by the way, Philemon is a Christian, and Onesimus has now become a Christian, and Paul just kind of floats this idea of their full equality before one another, <laughs> and he just leaves it. He doesn't command. He just kind of leaves it in Philemon's pocket to do the right thing. Now, we don't, we don't know what happened historically, but we know what happened historically. Historically, the slave trade collapsed in Rome eventually. <laughs> so by teaching the theological truths, you can undermine the activity, and that's exactly what they did. In brief, the apostles were confronted with an evil world as it existed, and they approached it by teaching about the equality of humans made in God's image and urging Christians to keep the glory of Jesus front and center of their own comforts. They did that because they believed that God would fix all injustices and reward all righteous suffering. Pastor, we've spent a lot of time on slavery. Why are we here? This is Mother's Day. Well, you know, some moms feel like slaves. That's, that's the only segue I've got. We're actually here because that's where the next thing in the, uh, in the text is. But the reality is, our society is looking for any excuse it can find to tear down Christianity and say it's untrue or it's fake and it's false. And I think we need to be equipped with what the answers are. So that even if like dealing with slavery isn't the thing you do this month, in about six months from now, somebody at work is going to make some snide comment about Christianity and slavery and you're going to go, you know, I don't remember all the details, but there's this sermon on YouTube, the pastor, that has something about it. Maybe we should go look at it and have a better answer next time, right? So, so that's one of the reasons we delve into some of these other topics. Well, let's move into verses 18 to 25. Let's, 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 let's disperse a little bit with that and, uh, to the specific circumstance that is flowing out of verse 13. Be subject for the Lord's... In fact, just look at it again. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. Again, what was one of the main points last week is that the gospel is on the line. In the things that we do, the life that we live, the gospel is on the line. People may or may not embrace Christ because of our activity. So, for the Lord's sake, for the Lord's sake, 
submit yourself to every, by the way, human institution, not God institution, human institution. Let's put ourselves properly in that line. So there's a couple of different words here for servant that, that Paul could have used. And I just want to pull out two words that are used a lots of times, a lots, a lot, lots of times in the scriptures. The first one uh, is, is this word here, and it's a relatively rare New Testament word, and it, and it relates to household slaves. In other words, the ones who are going to have daily contact with the master. Not necessarily the ones working the field. They may not have daily contact with their master, but if you're constantly rubbing shoulders with your master, this is kind of that situation. The other slave, and it, and it kind of emphasizes the position of slavery. The other word is, it's another Greek word, doulos, and Paul uses it all of the time to describe himself as a bond slave, and it emphasizes the master's power over you. And so Paul is always calling himself a slave. And again, we read the New Testament, and sometimes the translations say a servant of Christ Jesus. Uh, we have to inject slavery bondage there because we have to understand that Paul was not free to leave the slavery that he was in. He was a slave to Jesus. Jesus bought him, owned him, and commanded him. And that's the situation that he wanted us to know. Let's move forward a little bit into the text here. I want to... I want to deal with some of these other issues at another time here. There we go. Uh, there is a principle here at play, and I think this is the one that maintains the majority of uh, this text for us. So let's just read it again. Service to be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. There's a, there's a principle here of, well, trusting God to take care of injustice. Take a look, if you will, if you've got your Bible, go to Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through, or verse 10. Matthew 5, 10. Blessed are you, and again, if you hear Matthew 5, you should recognize the, the, the blessed section from Jesus. The, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When Jesus started going through all those blessings to his people, you know, blessed are you when you're poor, blessed are you when you're hunger and thirst for righteousness, you're going to be filled. Blessed are you if somebody, simply because you're a Christian, insults you or assaults you because you have insta reward in the kingdom of heaven. It's like the best thing that could happen to you as a Christian is to be insulted or assaulted because you're a Christian. Not because you did something stupid, <laughs> but because you're following Jesus. And if somebody turns against you because of your faith in Christ, the kingdom of heaven is yours. And that's tremendously earth-shaking because what's, that just goes directly against what we all want. We all want to be liked. We all want our little post on Facebook to get lots of thumbs up, right? Uh, it, recently, uh, here in the last several months, YouTube removed the numbers on the thumbs down button because, you know, they don't want people to feel bad because they can look at the thumbs down numbers, you know, things like that. Uh, because, you know, we just, we just, we all want people to like us. I want people to like me. You want people to like you. And so <clears throat> if, if the point comes where people don't like you because of your faith in Jesus, well then, good. <laughs> Blessed are you in that day because yours is the kingdom of heaven. And so Peter is essentially writing a letter. He's writing this book. First Peter is about that passage. I mean, not entirely, but it's about that passage to a people who need to hear that the blessedness of God is most important. He's writing to a people who need to remember that as strange as it is to our ears, God is pleased when his people trust him no matter what is going on in their lives. If you hear nothing else, listen to me. <laughs> God is pleased when you trust him no matter what else is going on in our lives. And we can fill in no matter what else with lots of scenarios. Do you trust him? It's like the penultimate moment in the, in the Disney Aladdin movie where, where uh, what's the, the guy's name is Aladdin and he's up, Jasmine. He's, he's, he's on the magic carpet and he floats up to, to talk to Jasmine and he's gonna, he's gonna meet her that night and, and he just asks a simple phrase, do you trust me? Holds out his hand. Do you trust me? I can say a lot of our life, God is just asking the question, do you trust me? Do you trust that I'm going to take care of you? Do you trust that I'm going to keep my promises? Do you trust that I'm going to be present even if you do walk through the fire? <laughs> even if you do go through the waters? Even if you do go through unjust suffering? Do you trust me? God is always asking us that question. So to a people who need to remember God is pleased when his people trust him despite abuse, 
so that they are acting exactly like Jesus, the suffering servant of Isaiah's prophecy, and he endured society's hatred and suffered. That is grace, says Peter. He says it's grace if because you are mindful of God, you endure sorrow and unjust suffering. Have you ever been treated unjustly? Ever been treated unfairly? You ever had uh, people tell fake stories about you because they didn't like you? <laughs> Most of us have. This sounds like high school to me. Unfortunately, not just high school. <laughs> We've all had lies told about us. But the question is, has anybody done those things to you because of your faith in Christ? Does your faith, does your following of Jesus mark you so supremely, so severely, that it becomes a target for people to aim at? I'm reminded of the book of Daniel. In the book of Daniel, uh, there was a bunch of uh, other leaders who were jealous of Daniel's excellence. I mean, the guy was just good at everything he did. And the king loved Daniel, and they knew that he was about to be elevated to the second highest position in the land, and things weren't going so good. And so they kind of took counsel together, you know, the meeting before the meeting. Oh, 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 the meeting before the meeting. They took counsel together at this meeting before the meeting. It's like, what are we going to do? There's no way. We, we can't bring a charge against Daniel. He's not lazy. He's not uh, bad at his books. He's not cheating and doing anything. I mean, we can't point at it. Here's the only thing. If we're going to cause a problem for Daniel, we're going to have to pick on something with relation to his faith in his God because that's the only thing that he's so, 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 so consistent about. Let's make it illegal to pray. And so what's the very next phrase? Daniel goes up on his roof like he has been all along and he prays in plain sight of everybody. Have you been marked like Daniel? Could somebody take a look at your life and say, you know what? This person is so consistent in every aspect of life. If I'm going to bring a charge against them, it's going to have to be with relation to, to their faith in Christ. And if, and if you haven't been marked that way, can I, can I just urge you? I mean, here's the directive, right, for the whole passage. Live that way. Live that way so that ultimately it is your faith and your obedience to Jesus that marks you as the person that everybody hates. Because that's, if I can say so, kind of the goal. <laughs> to be so marked by Christ that people act us, uh, treat us like they treated Jesus. By the way, what did they do to Jesus? Hey, they crucified him, right? This is, <laughs> this is not getting the, gold, the red carpet treatment. This is, this is the goal of pursuing persecution. Not for persecution's sake, but I want to be so marked by Christ that if somebody's going to complain about me, the only thing they can complain about is that I love Jesus more than them. And I think that's a pretty good goal. And that's exactly what Peter is saying you know, to this first group. And he's going to deal with other groups, and we're going to read those in the next couple of weeks. But be subject to your masters. And in other words, whatever you do, slave, because you can't get out of this situation, whatever you do, slave, I want you to work so hard for your masters I don't want you to do such a diligent, good, excellent job to the very best of your ability. I want you to, do, to, to excel at being the slaviest slave that ever was. Why? So that the only thing your master can have against you is that you love Jesus. Now, I want you to think about this because here's the scenario. If you're the, if you're the man of the house, if you're the owner of the property, if you're the owner of the slaves and even of your family because that's the position of men. We'll talk about that next week. But if you're the owner of the slaves and it would have been your command, your slaves would worship whatever your household gods were. If you particularly favored, I don't know, Zeus, you'd have had a statue of Zeus somewhere in your house or you'd have had a little uh, something and, and you would have commanded your wife, your children, your slaves, they would have, you're going to worship Zeus and that's it. So now imagine that you're the slave. You've some, suddenly come to Christ. You found out that Jesus died for you and you believe in him. And you're told you're not going to worship idols. And now your master comes to you and says, I want you to worship Zeus. And you're going to say, Master, I will do anything. I will polish your shoes. I will take the knife and clean out the grout on the floors. I will do the whole thing. I'm, I'll wash your underwear, but I'm not worshiping Jew, Zeus. I'm going to be the best slave you've ever had in your life. But this is just one area. Historically, we know some masters, a few, I think, would say, hmm, not really fond of that, but you're such a good slave, I guess I'm going to let you have it. You know what most of them would do? They'd beat the slave. Intro to unjust suffering. And I've got to tell you, this, this puts a whole new framework, by the way, on what it means to be mistreated for Jesus. <laughs> It has been a very rare event in my life for anybody to threaten to hit me because of Christ. 
It has happened. <laughs> but it's so rare. And if you refuse to bow at the altar of Zeus or Diana or whatever, you're going to suffer for that breach. Christians are called to live in such a way that this infraction would be the only kind of infraction that is punishable. And God sees that through eyes of profound grace. Christians ought to be the most excellent, whatever they are, of anybody else on the team. The best plumber, the best realtor, the best farmer, the best car mechanic, the best lawyer, best, best police officer, but you, whatever it is, Christians, we ought to be the absolute best at our task that we could possibly be. We ought to be better than all of the rest. Why? Because we want to be, put that on our business card? Yeah, sure, whatever. But no, <laughs> really, because the only thing people should have against us is that we love Jesus. They should never be able to look at us and say, well, yeah, they're a Christian, but they're also slobs. <laughs> they're a Christian, but they're also lazy at their work. They're a Christian, but they're also cheating on their taxes or their wives. Those arguments should never get labeled and leveled at a Christian. It is a gracious thing, however, if you, know, if, if you act foolishly, if you act the sinner and then you get punished for doing sin, God, you know, you get what you pay for. But if you're doing the right things and you're doing good and you're being faithful and you get punished for that, God's marking that down as rewardable moments for your life. I've known people who have, you know, left a cult that their family followed. And I've read the stories of the sons who left false religions of their parents. I had students down in Haiti who, at least one of them, was a uh, son of a witch doctor. <laughs> and he abandoned all of that in order to follow Christ. And it cost him. He can't go back to his village. He can't go back to his family. He can't go back to anywhere. But he said, I'd rather serve Jesus. Would you rather serve Jesus? I don't know. We can look at comparison stories. I guess there's not that many of them, but we can think about this bakery owner who has refused for 10 years now to bake a cake for a gay wedding, and he's finally going to make his case before the Supreme Court, I think, this year or next year or eventually. And he said in a recent article, despite the legal fees and whatever earthly wins or losses there may be, it is a gracious thing in the eyes of God if I suffer unjustly for doing the right thing. I think that man's been reading his Bible. It's worth it. It's been worth the negative publicity. It's been worth the upending of my life. It's been worth all of this. You know what that means? As we look at this, and we start in verse 21, and that there is a call for us, a call to unjust suffering. Look at verse 21. For to this you have been called. Sometimes the Bible is so abundantly clear about exactly what it means. For to this you have been called. Well, what have you been called to? Because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example. You know, Jesus said, uh, they hated me, they're going to hate you too. Is the reality as Christians, we, we have to be in love with pleasing Christ and not in love with pleasing the world. What's the easiest thing to do, though? Try to please the world. Because we can see them. We can't, we can't see Jesus. I mean, I, with you know, my, my eyes, my heart, maybe, I can see Jesus. But I can't see him. I don't see Jesus just kind of standing in the corner going, that's my boy. Right? I want that. But we don't see it. That's why he's asking us to live by faith. That the words that he has given us will be fulfilled. It says, Peter says, your supreme example is Christ. Listen to, uh, in fact, here it is, John 15, 18. If the world hates you, Jesus says, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, if, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours but all these things they will do to you on account of my name because they do not know him who sent me. Second Timothy, uh, Paul tells uh, Timothy, he says, you know, <laughs> of this you can be certain, <laughs> anybody who wants to live for Christ will suffer persecution. But there's a call for us to, to in, a, in essence, pursue being persecuted because of our faith and our love for Jesus. So what example do we have in Christ? Uh, 
By the way, it's, it's poor theology to say that Jesus came only as an example. Jesus didn't come only as an example. He is an example, but he didn't come as an example. Jesus came as a savior, and his life is an example, okay? There's a big difference there. But I have known, and I have read the books of those who say Jesus came only as an example. So I just, just want to give you a heads up there. He starts by talking to the slaves, right? Because that is how Jesus came. Isaiah 53, one of the most famous passages. By the way, Isaiah 53 is the background for what Peter is writing here. When he writes and he says, you know, you, you, you have gone astray like sheep and we've come to our master. Now, this is language right out of Isaiah 53. It's also coming right out of Philippians 2.7, declares that Jesus came as a servant both times. The suffering servant of Isaiah and coming as a servant in Philippians. Our Lord humbled himself by concealing all of his glory and he dignifies the very lowest in society by becoming as they are. That's why Peter starts with the slaves because they're at the bottom of the pit. Well, there's something else here. In verse 22, the call of unjust suffering is our call to repentance. Well, because look what he says here in verse 22. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. What did we just read about Jesus? He came as an example or he shows us an example also. If Jesus' example was sinlessness, then our example is going to have to be repentance because I can't do the sinless thing. Every Christian is called to an absolute lifestyle of perpetualized repentance, always turning away from sin, always turning to Christ, always turning away from sin, always turning towards Christ. Why are we always doing that? Well, because we keep turning back to sin. <laughs> and we do it automatically. And I'm not here to beat you up for that. I'm just here to tell you that, look, the church is the safest place in the world to repent. It better be. <laughs> we better be the best repenters on the planet. That's one of my life goals, to be one of the best repenters I can be. People should know that when I mess up, I turn back to Christ. That's why I tried to raise my kids that way. And I would go to my kids late at night after I'd tucked them in and stomped away angrily, whatever that, you know, had gone on that day. Parenting Confessions 101. And I sit down on the edge of the bed and say, you know what? I lost my temper today and I'm really sorry. It's okay, Daddy. No, 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 it's not okay. I'm telling you right now, it's not okay that I lost my temper and yelled like that. I should never have yelled like that, and I'm asking you to forgive me, not to say it was okay. The most precious sound in my ears has always been, I forgive you, Daddy. Are you the chief repenter in your home? You should be the chief repenter in your home. Moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, people should know us as repenters. Always turning away from sin and always turning back to Christ. Man, I would love to not have to turn away from sin. <laughs> and maybe I've gotten better in areas over the years. I don't yell as much as I used to. That's probably good, right? But I'm willing to bet, just like everything else, there's something else sneaking up under the rug, <laughs> ready to grab me by the ankles. And I'll have to go and repent again. Because this is what we're called to, Christian. Always turning away from sin, always turning to Christ. None of us are ever going to achieve perfection on this planet. Man, I wish I could. <laughs> but here's the promise of 1 John. When he appears, we're going to become just like him because we're going to see him as he is. The call to unjust suffering is our call to repentance. The call of unjust suffering is also a call to trust in God's justice. We're all going to face injustice at different points in our life. It's going to come in all kinds of different shapes. It's going to come in all different kinds of forms. Somebody's going to betray you. Somebody's not going to pay you. Somebody's going to take something from you. Somebody's going to lie to you. Something's going to happen. It's going to come into your life. Some kind of injustice. The question is, look at verse 23. We can take the shortcut and say, okay, if I'm called to suffer, I'm also called to stoically take it. That's not what's being said here. We're not being called to stoically take it. We are being called to trust that God will take care of this. God will take care of this too. It's in God's hands. I'm going to trust him to deal with it. If you, let me ask you that question. Because one of the hard things I know, I, over the years, I, I, I've done this pastoring job long enough to know that sometimes some of us have been sinned against in such a way that we find it awfully hard to forgive. I get it. Trust me. I get it. Forgiveness doesn't mean Eh, doesn't matter. It's all good. It's okay. It's not what the forgiveness means. Forgiveness means that I am not going to become the judge, jury, and executioner. I'm going to trust God to do whatever is right. I'm going to trust that person into God's hands. 
and I may even pray for their soul. In fact, I ought to pray for their soul. If there's ever a chance that that person could join me side by side at the throne of Christ, oh, that'd be awesome. I mean, if you forgave me, you can forgive anybody. How I wish you would. Can you do that? Can you take that wound, however deep that wound is, and sometimes those wounds go all the way down. Can you take that wound, lay it before the Lord and say, you know what, God, I'm going to trust you to take care of this. This is, this, is, this is no longer my problem. This is your problem. He's got shoulders big enough to let him have the problem. I'm not going to throw it off and say it doesn't matter. I'm going to throw it to him and say he's the only righteous judge. And finally, we should end with this as the passage tries to end, bringing us right by reframing the gospel for us again. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you've been healed, Isaiah 53. You were straying like sheep, Isaiah 53, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. And that is this, the call of unjust suffering. When you suffer, it is a call to love the gospel. Every Christian needs to remember our own story, the moment that Jesus intervened. Do you remember the moment that Jesus intervened in your life? Might have been when you were like four and a half years old and you heard the gospel and understood it. Might have been when you were eight, 10, 14, 18, 27. But do you remember when Jesus intervened in your life? Those people who do not love Jesus and hate it when you do are no more lost than we were before that moment. We once were straying like sheep, but Jesus in his suffering has endured the price of our sin. His wounds have healed us. His death has bought us. And by grace, we have returned from our straying to the shepherd and the overseer of our souls. By the way, a shepherd is charged and tasked with taking care of the wounds of his sheep. Sheep don't have to go out and chase the wolves. That's the shepherd's job. In fact, the shepherd will wrap the wounds of his sheep. Make sure his sheep are fed. Make sure his sheep are healed. And ultimately, will be their guardian day and night. Do you, whatever your situation, trust God to be your guardian day and night? Let's pray. Father, I pray for your church. I'm asking you, Father, this today that you will move us towards trusting you in the midst of whatever circumstance we find ourselves in. Some of us might be where this, this, this passage doesn't apply to us. We're just not being mistreated for Christ. We're not being uh, facing injustice. That's all right. Take this word, Lord, and plant it deep in our hearts and prepare us for that time. Move us into this perpetualized repentance that you called us to and help us to love your gospel more and more and more. But Father, for the ones that are here this morning that have been deeply, deeply hurt, that have faced injustice, that have been mistreated, and especially the ones who are most inclined to want to seek revenge, Father, take our hearts now. Take our hearts at this moment and move us forward into trusting you to be the one that takes care of the details. I pray for your glory. I pray for your saints and I pray for your church to rise up and to declare and to live the gospel in every area of our life. Amen.